The sermon this morning may not be short, but the subject is. The subject is so, and that is so, S-O, so. We are turning this morning to a text which we customarily do not do. We are turning to the third chapter of John's Gospel, verse 16. I am reading this morning from my Greek text because I believe that the original, even in a familiar verse like this, brings out several things that are very important. For so loved God the world that he gave the Son, the only begotten one, in order that anyone believing into him might not perish, but have life everlasting. That's our text today, and that's our subject. And there is a sinking feeling as I come to this subject of total inadequacy in the presence of a text like this. I think it can be said of this text what Emerson said of the essays of Montaigne. He says, cut these words and they bleed. And my beloved, if you cut the words of John 3.16, they'll bleed. It's part of an interview which Nicodemus had with our Lord at night. This verse sums up all that had previously been covered in the discourse. It's, I think, far from satisfactory to try and understand John 3.16 apart from that nocturnal discourse and interview that was held at night. But in view of the fact that we're today lifting out only one word it will only be necessary to consider this word in the context of the verse and not the verse in the context of the entire chapter. Now, we wish this morning to examine, first of all, the mechanics of this verse. And actually, there's always a real danger of spoiling the beauty of a verse by doing that. It's like digging up flowers to see what makes them grow. It's like lifting up the hood of a car to see what makes it run. It's like dissecting a body to see what makes it tick. And so to this verse apart, which we want to do, why, it may spoil the beauty, but it may give us an understanding of it. Now, these are simple words in the Gospel of John. The fact of the matter is, if you go through the entire gospel, you will find that most of the words he uses are monosyllabic words, that is, words of one syllable. He uses very few polysyllabic words. Sometimes he does use a disyllabic word, two syllables, it very frequently one of three syllables. And so that we have in this verse here actually simplicity indeed. And so, because we are today familiar with these words, the assumption is that we know this verse because we're familiar with it. Well, let's make sure today that we do know these words that are here. First of all, let me say the two verses that immediately precede verse 316 are important and are very important to the understanding of John 3.16. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now, as Moses, even so must the Son of Man First of all, our Lord is calling Nicodemus' attention to something with which he was very familiar, the story in the Old Testament of the lifting up 
of the serpent in the wilderness. And he says, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And the emphasis is upon the must, of course. And it corresponds to the must that our Lord gave to Nicodemus at the very beginning. He said, ye must be born again. And if ye must be born again, then the Son of Man must be lifted up. The necessity to be born again makes imperative the lifting up of Christ upon the cross. It's a divine compulsion. If man ought to be born again, then he must be lifted up. Now, in verses 14 and 15 that I've just read, you actually, therefore, have the human view. Our Lord presents the human view of his cross. In verse 16, now, he presents the heavenly view. We have in the first verses, 14 and 15, we have what might be called the geocentric verses, earth-centered verses. In verse 16, it's uranocentric, it's heaven-centered verses, if you please. And therefore, John 3.16 is the view of the cross from heaven. Our Lord, for Nicodemus, he threw open the doors of heaven that night for him and for us, and we behold the King of glory, not on a throne with a crown, but on a cross, if you please. Christ reveals his cross to Nicodemus, and he did that three years before he died. At the very beginning of his ministry, his first trip to Jerusalem, he lets Nicodemus in on something that he did not even reveal to his own apostles until six months before he went to the cross. And by the way, that's the answer to these that say the Lord Jesus was caught in Jerusalem as a helpless, hopeless man between the upper millstone of Roman power and the lower millstone of religious cupidity, and he was ground to powder. That's not true. Because three years before, here in Jerusalem, he revealed to this man the cross, and had he wanted to avoid it, he could have stepped over into the east, into the orient, where there were teeming millions in that day, and have been lost. And Rome and the religious rulers could never have touched him. But that was not his thought. Because, as he says here, as we come now to this verse, loved God the world. And that's important, because the Greek always puts first in a sentence that which is in the important part of the sentence. Actually, God is not the important part, and the world is not the important part. The important part here is loved. Love stands first here, and it comes first, and the emphasis is upon love. And that was brand new. Now, we are taught that when we begin in Sunday school today, and the little ones begin to mouth it. And I dare say there's not a person listening to me this morning that couldn't stand up right where you are and give John 3.16. But do you know what it means? Do you know how brand new it is to tell a world that God loves the world? Well, not many believe that today. They can repeat the verse, but they don't believe it today. And the word love is an interesting word. The emphasis is there. In the Greek, there are three words that can be translated love. That reveals how barren the English language is. Hollywood would give a million dollars if they had another word for love. And if you can think of one, well, you'll help them out. But the Greeks had three words for it. One was eros. And from that we get our word erotic. It's sensual love. It's never used in the New Testament. Never. Then there is the word phileo, which is used in the New Testament. And that word means its highest is friendship. It means to say, I like you. And it doesn't mean any more. 
That's not the word used here because you cannot say that God so liked the world. You can't tone it down to that degree at all. The other word, and the word used here, is agapao, and that's love in the highest degree. That is an attribute of God, and it's not human love. And the love that a believer is supposed to have is not a human love. It's that which the Holy Ghost gives us, as we shall see this morning. Now, God so loved the world. Now, the world here is the Greek word cosmos. We get our word cosmic, or our, our word cosmos from it. It means that which is the ordered world in which we live. Here it means the world of mankind, and it means all men. It's not limited to the elect only. It's not limited to the good. It's not limited to white people. It's limited to the totality of the human race from Adam right down to the present moment. This business today of saying God loved only the elect or certain ones is not the language of the Word of God at all. I always think in this connection of what George Orwell in his book Animal World said. He said all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than other animals. And I'm afraid a great many folk today define equality in that sort of way. Well, God says that he loves the totality of the human family. Not one is excluded. You are not excluded today. Then it says he gave, as love was revealed in the fact he gave. And again, it's the totality of the gift. It doesn't say he gave him to die. He did. That's included. But it means more than that. It means when Christ came into the world 1,900 years ago, beginning with the virgin birth and ending up with his death, his resurrection, and ascension into heaven, and even his present ministry today and his coming again is God's gift. God gave, if you please. And then it says he gave his only begotten Son. And there's been a great deal made of the only begotten Son. It has no reference at all to a begetting. If you'll notice, when I read it in the original, it doesn't say God gave his only begotten Son. He didn't beget him. It's the Son, the begotten Son. That's his title. That's not something that he got because he was born. It's something that belonged to him. And the only begotten is unique. It means that he is unique. It was in the Old Testament. Let me give only one reference today. It says in Psalm 22, verse 20, Deliver my soul from the sowed, my darling from the power of the dog. Now that word darling means my only one. That's what it means. Christ is the only one. He's unique. He is the only one that was virgin-born. He was the only one in his birth. He was the only one in the life that he lived. He's the only person that ever lived a perfect life. And it's only of Christ that God's been able to say, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. He never said that about you, and he's never said that about me, and he couldn't say it. But he did a Christ. He's the only one who could die for the sins of the world. He is the only one who's back from the dead today in a glorified body. He is today the only hope of the world, the only begotten Son. Now, these are the words that we need to look at. Now let's come back to our little word, so. God so loved. Well, how much is that? Let me give a little different translation of it and widen that word out. God loved to such an astounding and astonishing degree. Now, the question is, is there some way to bring this word out of heaven and reduce it to the terminology of earth? 
Can you bring the little word so down here and give it an incarnation so you can look at it? Is it possible today to put a yardstick down by the little word so and measure it? How much did God love the world? Well, Paul suggests, and it's merely suggestive, over in Ephesians, the third chapter, verse 18, it's in that one of these very wonderful prayers, he says this, among those things that he prayed for, that you may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now can we put down this morning a yardstick on that little word, so, and get the breadth of it, and get the length of it, and get the depth of it, and get the height of it. Let's see if we can measure this morning the love of God. And here's where I really feel inadequate. How are you going to measure it? Well, let's look at the breadth of the love of God. How wide is the love of God? We suggested this. His arms today encompass the entire world so that all are included. And when it says he loves all, it means that he loves each one. He loves you. And I frankly feel that John 3.16 is the most personal verse that there is in the Bible. And it's personal to you and it's personal to me. And I mean this way, it's more personal than if he had said this morning, God so loved Vernon McGee. Now, candidly, I'm glad that he didn't say that. And I'll tell you why. I was in Seattle several years ago holding meetings at the West Side Presbyterian Church I got a call one morning from a lady, and she began as if she knew me very well. And I said, I beg your pardon, but uh, who am I speaking to? Oh, she says, this is Miss So-and-so from a certain place in Iowa. Well, I said, I just don't know someone. And she said to me, are you kidding? She said, you were my pastor in Iowa for years. I said, lady, I've never been a pastor in Iowa. She said, are you the Vernon McGee of the certain Methodist church? And I said, no, ma'am, I'm not. She said, I beg your pardon. When I saw your name in the paper, I was sure that you had fallen from grace and become a Presbyterian, <laughs> and that you were the Vernon McGee that was formerly my pastor. And I said, no, and I said, I didn't know that there was another one loose. And she said, yes, apparently there is. Now, you see, I'm glad that John 3.16 doesn't say, God so loved Vernon McGee, because it may be that other Vernon McGee. And it wouldn't include me. But when God says, God so loved the world, that means me, and that means you. May I say to you, you couldn't have a verse more personal than this verse right here. God so loved the world. We accept that because it's commonplace today. We've heard it so much. But let me ask you, how could he love this rotten, stinking world with all of its sin, its rebellion, its meanness, its ugliness, its sordidness today? Oh, he might love some people that are lovely and cultured and refined and educated and those that are the best. But you don't mean to tell me he loves those savages in Africa who ate people for Christmas dinner. I mean that he loves them just as much as he loves you this morning. Just as much. If you somehow or another think today you are one of God's little pets, and that somehow or another he's displayed his love on you and no one else, you're wrong. God loves the world. God made a level place at the cross, and that's the only place where you have real integration. None are righteous there, and all have sinned, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. 
He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. God this morning has his arms outstretched to a gainsaying, lost, rebellious world. They spat in his face when he was here, and they're still spitting in his face today, and he still comes on and says, I love them. And in that poem of Francis Thompson, The Hound of Heaven, he attempts to show. A great many thought he was being blasphemous. He's a bloodhound on your trail. And he won't let up. And he says, I fled him down the night. I fled him under running water. And he came on and on and on and on. He loves you like that. A colored boy, Negro boy that joined the church years ago in my Southland. They examined him and it was a fundamental church. And they asked him, how would you get saved? And he said, I did my part, and God did his part. And they thought they had him. They said, what was your part, and what was God's part? He says, my part was the sinning. His part was the saving. I done run from him as far as these sinful legs and this sinful, rebellious heart could carry me. And he done took out after me till he done run me down. My friend, that's the way you got saved, and that's the way I got saved if we got saved. He loves this world. He loves this world. And years ago in England, when the Quaker movement got underway, the, oh, what a warm movement that was at first. That's where John Wesley got saved. Miles Hall had a young married preacher. He just went everywhere, and finally his wife, in despair, she says, Would God I'd married a drunkard that I might find him in the ale house. But now I cannot tell where to find him. He goes everywhere preaching the gospel. My friend, he had the love of Christ in his heart because God loves Every body. There's no exception. Well, that's so much for the breadth of the love of God. What about the length of it? That he gave his only begotten Son. Now, the test of love is to what length it'll go. That boy that sent a note over to his girl always suspected that fellow. He sent a note over. He said, I love you. I would climb the highest mountain for you. I would cross the widest ocean for you. I would swim the deepest river for you. I would go through storm and hail for you. If it does not rain Wednesday night, I'll be over to see you. May I say to you, my friend, we demonstrate our love, and God has demonstrated his love to the extent to which he'd go. Love is not love which will not die or make sacrifices that are often bitter and even more cruel than death. Now, in John 3.16, you actually only have the declaration of the love of God. There's only one place where you find the exposition of the love of God, and that's in the fifth of Romans. You want to know how much God loves? You want to know the length of it to which he's gone? Listen to this. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And this is one of the things that Paul says is a fruit of justification by faith. 
because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. And I'm also convinced that only the, the Spirit of God can make this real to us. And these are days when a great many people are called to go through deep waters and dark nights and face problems and face them alone. And they need to know that God loves them. And the only way in the world for them to know it is not by me saying it, but it's by the Holy Spirit making it real to your heart. He alone can make it real to your heart. Love ever gives, forgives, outlives, and ever stands with open hands. And while it lives, it gives, for this is love's prerogative to give and give and give. And God is on the giving end. He is not asking one thing from this world today. And I'm afraid we preachers give the wrong impression that God's asking this world for something. He's not asking this world for anything. He said, if I was hungry, you think I'd tell you? You think if I wanted gold, I would ask you for you the little puny amount you got at Fort Knox today? Why, the gold and the silver's mine. And the cattle on a thousand hills... God says, I don't want anything from you, but I would like to give you something. Eternal life in Christ Jesus. God so loved the world, he gave. And he gave his only begotten son and gave him not only at Bethlehem, not only in a perfect life, not only to teach, not only to reveal God, but he gave him to die upon the cross for the sins of the world. And my friend, what else can you ask him to do for you today? Can you think of anything else that God could do for you, a sinner, today than to give his son to die for you, that he might save you? I took this out several years ago of a, one of our metropolitan papers. It struck me it was a picture of a mother and a son. It, the title, though, said, Father Gives Life for Son. I'll read it. Sidney Lawrence underwent a cross transfusion for his son Robert, left in the picture in which blood of father and son mingle. Father's kidney worked for both, allowing the son's diseased kidney to recuperate. But the father was sensitive to proteins in his son's blood, causing his death. May I say to you that that man didn't have to stand up and say, I love my son. He proved it. He gave his life for his boy. And as many a father would do that. My friend, God has given his son to die for you. You want to ask him to do something else? He's gone the very length of love. Now let's look at the depth of the love of God that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. We today are all hell-doomed and deserving sinners, every one of us. A great many people today think that mankind is on some sort of a trial, that God wants to see if mankind will do better or not. That's not so. If you read on, and after John 3.16, our Lord says, He that believeth not is condemned already. Somebody says, What about the heathen that never heard of Christ? My friend, they're lost. We're all born lost. You're not on trial. You're lost. God is not trying to see what you're going to do. God says you're condemned. He's trying to save you. And He's trying to save you. Though you be unlovely, though you be unworthy, He does it because He loves you. There's no other reason. Man today is suffering from an incurable disease, sin. Adam all died. 
And God alone today has a cure. And you reject the cure, and it'll mean death. A doctor told me some time ago, if she had only come to me six months earlier, I could have cured her, but it means death now. And in three months, she was dead. God says, why will ye die? The Lord Jesus says, ye will not come to me that you might have life. You're not on trial, my friend. You're dead in trespasses and sins. Oh, the lovely thing that is said in Luke's gospel, he entered and passed through Jericho. Why? Because there was the chief of the publicans, a rotten crook, if you please, and he was going to save him. He entered and passed through Jericho. He didn't stay there. He didn't even spend the night just long enough to win Zacchaeus. And you can widen that out. He entered and passed through this world. John's gospel has the tremendous movement. He said, I have come forth from the Father, and I'm coming to the world. Again, I leave the world, and I go to the Father. He entered and passed through this world. Why? Because you were here, and he wanted to save you. And don't tell me this morning he didn't die for you. He died for you. From the depths of the doom and darkness ascends that wondrous road, which leads the heart of the sinner up to the heart of God. For from heights of the golden city, he made the glorious road which leads to the heart of the sinner down from the heart of God. He made the way. He entered and passed through Jericho. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. What about the height? of the love of God. The last one, they shall have everlasting life. May I be personal again? I'm going to heaven someday. Somebody says, well, you must be very good. On the contrary, I'm not very good. Look, if you knew me, like I know myself, you wouldn't sit there and listen to me. But don't you leave. Because if I knew you, like you know yourself, I wouldn't stand up here and talk to you. I'm going to heaven someday because Christ died for me. And I trusted him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. I have not scaled the heights. I have not plumbed the depths this morning. I have not exhausted the treasures of reason today. I have not widened this out as wide as it should be. Because Paul says, to know the love of Christ that passeth knowledge. I'm not able to communicate to you today the vastness of the love of God, the intensity of that love, the overwhelming goodness of our God today. If I could, it would break your heart. And it would break mine if I only knew. If I had this morning the voice of an archangel and the vision of a seraphim, the eloquence of a Demosthenes and the logic of a Cicero and the brilliance of a Burke and the golden pictures of a Chrysostom, I could not convey to you today the love of God. I can only say this morning, God loves you. And that love is revealed in Christ at the cross. And hear me, you will only find it there. It's not on the mountain. 
It's not on the sea, it's not in the valley, and it's not in nature. It's only at the cross of Christ you'll find the love of God. I said from this pulpit, it was nearly 17 years ago, I said that God does not reveal his love in nature, only at the cross. And I was challenged right down front. A man came down and he said, I want you to know that I've just come from the northwest. And I stood beneath those majestic redwood trees. And I stood by those running brooks. And you tell me that I did not sense the love of God. And I said, sir, you did not sense the love of God. You can only find the love of God in the cross of Christ. That man may be here this morning. If you are, sir, I have a question for you. Why don't you go ask the people that live now in northern California and on along the Oregon coast whether they found any of the love of God in nature? It was destruction. God has only revealed his love in the cross of Christ. And the word of God makes it clear. God so loved the world that he gave redwood trees and babbling brooks. No, sir. God so loved the world he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever Believe in him, would not perish, but have everlasting life. Only the Holy Spirit can make this real to you. I cannot. I'm dependent on him. The love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who is given unto us. And I'm of the opinion that there are people here today and listening in that need to have the love of God made real to them through these dark hours through which they're passing. Nothing, either great or small, nothing sinner, no. Jesus died and paid it all long, long ago. When he from his lofty throne stooped in love to die, everything was fully done. Hearken to his cry. Weary, working, burdened one, wherefore toil ye so? Cease your doing, all was done. Long, long ago. Tell to Jesus' work you cling by a simple faith. Doing is a deadly thing. Doing ends in death. Cast your deadly doing down, down at Jesus' feet. Stand in him, in him alone, gloriously complete. It is finished. Yes, indeed, finished every jot. Sinner, this is all you need. Tell me, is it not? Shall we pray? With our heads this morning bowed in prayer, I believe the Holy Spirit has spoken to your heart today. I can't make you to know the love of God, but if this morning you'll look to Christ and trust him, I assure you the Holy Spirit will speak to your heart. And make the Lord Jesus a reality to you, and we need reality today. Right where you're sitting, friend today, whoever you are, wherever you are, however you are, he loves you. He loves you. Awful to turn you back on love. This boy... But his dad gave his life for him. I don't imagine that boy's running down his dad today and turning his back on him at all in his memory. I'm sure he must be grateful. He's a kid if he's otherwise. 
God loves you. He's given his son to die for you. The greatest sin in the world today is to reject Jesus Christ. God's love you. I'm wondering if you are here today and would like to say, Preacher, would you pray for me that Jesus Christ might become a reality to me and I might experience the love of God in my heart? I need him today. We all need him, but you today maybe have not yet trusted him and we'd like to give this to you as your opportunity right where you're sitting. Would you like to say, Preacher, pray for me?